Hey guys, Tyler here. For many Star Trek fans, Strange New Worlds has been a breath of fresh air, a return of sorts to the classic original series episodic format. Strange New Worlds arguably had one of the strongest first seasons of any Trek show, offering fun plot lines and tackling characterization and major socio-political themes like any good sci-fi does. But Strange New Worlds has also made some controversial creative decisions, a trend that has continued with the show's second season. Now, in my view, not all of these controversial decisions have been bad, per se, just different. Which brings me to one of the most talked about episodes from season two, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow. In this outing, Enterprise security officer La'an Noonien Singh and an alternate James T. Kirk travel back to 2022 Earth to complete a deceased Federation temporal agent's mission to stop the Romulans from killing Khan Noonien Singh and preventing the Federation from forming in the first place. The episode officially pushes back the dates of Khan's birth and the eugenics wars to the 21st century. Between this and other juicy lore drops, I thought I'd make a video giving my thoughts on Star Trek Strange New Worlds timeline alterations and pose the question, are they even necessary? Let's find out. First, a little background. I've discussed Khan, the eugenics wars, the temporal cold war, and more in various videos over the years. Some of which I guess are now outdated, so thanks Strange New Worlds! Long story short, Khan and the eugenics wars were first introduced in the original series episode, Space Seed. We learn that Khan is an augment, the product of selective breeding and genetic engineering programs on Earth during the mid 20th century. In 1992, Khan and a group of his fellow supermen took control of vast portions of territory on Earth in an event called the Eugenics Wars, which led to over 30 million deaths. Khan and the Augments were eventually beaten back by unenhanced humans, and Khan and 84 of his followers escaped Earth aboard the interplanetary sleeper ship SS Botany Bay setting a course outbound from the solar system with no apparent destination. After drifting in space for over 200 years aboard the Botany Bay, Khan is revived from cryosleep and attempts to take over the Enterprise. He is exiled, along with the 72 remaining sleepers, on the planet Seti Alpha 5, before attempting to exact his revenge on Kirk in Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan first played by Mexican actor Ricardo Montalban, and then by the widest actor on Earth, Benedict Cumberbatch, the character of Khan has been a staple of the franchise and has immense pop culture recognition. So it makes sense that not only would his name be invoked on multiple occasions, What if one of those people grew yes, up? Yes, Professor. I know. What if one of those lives I saved down there is a child who grows up to be the next Adolf Hitler, or Khan Singh? But that the other Star Trek shows would feature augment storylines, such as DS9's Dr. Bashir, I presume, and, well, Enterprise's augment arc. But as Star Trek Productions continued to reference Khan and the Eugenics Wars, the real-world approaching date of the 1990s forced Star Trek's creative staff to make some tough calls. For instance, in the two-part Voyager episode, Future's End, the crew travels back to 1996 Los Angeles to track down the 29th century time ship Eon, which entrepreneur Henry Starling has reverse engineered and capitalized off of, influencing the personal computer revolution of the late 20th century. When writing Future's End, Voyager's creative staff had to make a conscious decision as to whether or not they would even mention the eugenics wars, which, remember, wrapped up in 1996. Khan even says the year 1996 in The Wrath of Khan, so that date has always been canon. Ultimately, the writers of Future's End opted to ignore the eugenics wars because they felt bringing it up would be distracting 
and I can kind of understand this. After all, Khan's empire is said to have been based in Asia, the overall territory of the Augments consisting of 40 nations that comprise over a quarter of the Earth's population. Alternatively, the non-canon comic Star Trek Khan, released as a tie-in to the film Star Trek Into Darkness, portrays the eugenics wars as an open armed conflict in the 1990s that affects the whole globe and involves the detonation of nuclear weapons arguably an early version of World War III. This is consistent with comments made by Spock in the original series, loosely implying the eugenics wars and World War III to be the same thing, which was later retconned by Star Trek The Next Generation, at least as far as its time period. Admittedly, Star Trek Into Darkness does take place in the Kelvin timeline, and the implication of Future's End to me has always been that that episode also takes place in an alternate timeline. But the mere fact that the Voyager writers were even thinking about the eugenics wars speaks to the struggle Star Trek's creative staff have endured over the years regarding how they approach canon. I've personally never had an issue reconciling the idea that Star Trek takes place in an alternate timeline, what with its six Voyager probes and the more advanced spaceflight in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. It's all fiction, so it should be no surprise that events in Trek's history don't perfectly line up with the real world. But since Star Trek has always been meant to be presented as an optimistic possible future for humanity, it does make sense that Star Trek's writers would strive to make the Trek timeline conform to a degree to our current lived reality. One of the most blatant examples of this effort comes with the conclusion of the two-part Enterprise episode, Stormfront, after defeating the Not Cool's efforts to undermine the Federation by killing Vladimir Lenin and then allying with Nazi Germany in World War II, the crew of the NX-01 Enterprise help restore the timeline to its rightful course. In a sequence towards the end of the episode, we see Daniels talk with Jonathan Archer as the time stream resets itself. Several images relevant to Earth's history flash by, including the September 11th attacks and a meeting between George W. Bush and Tony Blair, recent events when the episode was produced, and ones that occurred after 1996. Much like the Next Generation era shows, Enterprise, in an effort not to contradict real life, never committed to saying if the eugenics wars really did happen in the 1990s, though a Botany Bay Easter egg, a picture of the DY-100 class, does appear earlier in Future's End. Into Darkness does also refer to Khan as the product of mid 20th century genetic engineering experiments, but as far as the Prime Universe, it's not really until Strange New Worlds that the franchise really commits to a hard date again. Following up on another Easter egg in the season 2 finale of Star Trek Picard, the pilot episode of Strange New Worlds implies the eugenics wars to be a distinctly 21st century conflict an evolution of the Second Civil War, which begins in 2026, and a precursor to World War III, which culminates in 2053. While this timeline is still somewhat vague, Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow finally confirms that the eugenics wars were, quote-unquote, supposed to happen in the 1990s, but were pushed back as a result of temporal incursions. We learn this from Sarah, a Romulan temporal agent surgically altered to appear human who has been trapped on Earth for 30 years. She seeks to kill Khan Noonien Singh, not out of altru- not out of altruism, not out of al uh, shrimp on the bobby, pack the car. She seeks to assassinate Khan not out of altruism for humanity, but because a computer simulation told her to do so, the Romulans having built computers to calculate the results of changes in the timeline. She muses that perhaps humanity needed the Dark Age brought on by Khan to reach their enlightenment, or perhaps it was just random. Either way, if she kills Khan, the Federation will never form. We see this is true as this episode's version of Kirk is from the alternate future 
where Sarah was successful. Once again, Sarah directly asserts that this was all supposed to happen in 1992, but unexpectedly, temporal shenanigans have delayed events surrounding the eugenics wars. This isn't just a fun nod to TOS lore, but it's actually confirmation that Strange New Worlds does indeed take place in an alternate timeline from the original series. But here's the thing. It's probably not just Strange New Worlds, or even Discovery. I know that a lot of you guys like to get angry in the comments whenever I even bring up Star Trek produced after 2005. You'll type things like, Discovery is in an alternate timeline. Well, congratulations folks. <laughs> Well, congratulations folks, you won. I am officially giving you permission to gloat about this because as it turns out, you were right. But actually, actually, hold on, hold on a second. Before you do, let me ask you this question. Is it just New Trek that takes place in an alternate timeline? Or does this also extend to Enterprise? I think it might. I think it probably does. Ever since the Temporal Cold War storyline was introduced in Enterprise, fans have used it and apparent continuity errors in the early seasons to argue that the entire show is itself set in an alternate timeline. Whether it truly is or not is important for one thing in determining what kind of future Daniels comes from, something I've made multiple videos about, which are also probably now outdated. Links in the description. But hold on a second. If Enterprise takes place in an alternate timeline from the original series, what about The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine and Voyager? I mean, seriously. Dialogue in TNG's pilot encounter at Farpoint and the film Star Trek First Contact, placing World War III in the mid-21st century, arguably contribute to TNG's status as a soft reboot of the original series. Is Star Trek the original series even canon anymore? Or did it already lose its canon status in the 1980s? Okay, I, I admit that's kind of a loaded question. And is Star Trek Picard actually a direct continuation of TNG or just the same people with subtly different pasts? I know that all of you already have an opinion on that. What I'm getting at is it's unclear where exactly we should draw the line or should I say lines? Multiple uh, of them. The Temporal Cold War was introduced in real life in 2001 with the Enterprise pilot Broken Bow. Chronologically, Enterprise is a prequel, but is it a true prequel? This is something that people have been kind of asking since like 2001. <sighs> And this is what time travel does to a franchise. Overall, it's clear that at the very least, there's a pre-Temporal Wars alteration timeline and a post-Temporal Wars alteration timeline. Likely more than one of the latter. Which shows fit into which categories is still kind of up for debate. And I think that's okay. We don't really need all of the answers to these questions. That's not what is as important. What is important is that Star Trek continues to tell good, compelling stories. And at this point, the cat's kind of out of the bag when it comes to, you know, continuity errors or perceived canon violations. The exact details surrounding the lives of Spock, Kirk, Pike, Uhura, Chapel, and all the other characters we know and love might be in a bit of a state of temporal flux as it were, but the broad strokes are still there. Spock as a character is still logical, although Strange New Worlds is exploring more of his emotional side. Kirk is still a straight shooter and a charismatic leader. I don't necessarily agree with the Strange New Worlds writer's interpretation of the Temporal Cold War, and I don't think that explaining away all of these timeline alterations in excruciating detail like they're kind of doing is absolutely necessary. But I, I don't really mind it to the point that it like ruins the show for me or ruins the franchise. And I don't think you should mind it either. God, they are not gonna like me telling them what to think. Okay, let's pause for a minute and recap what we know so far, or at least what I think we know. I, I'm trying my best, guys, give me a break. Strange New Worlds confirms that at some point, 
There was no longer perfect continuity between Star Trek the original series and some of the new shows, continuing the trend of soft retcons established as early as The Next Generation or even the TOS movies to a degree. Somewhere along the way, the dates of World War III were possibly shifted from the 1990s, concurrent with the original dates of the eugenics wars, to the mid-21st century as established in Encounter at Farpoint and First Contact. This means that even as early as the real world year of 1987, you can make an argument that there was a TOS timeline and a TNG timeline. Placement of the TOS films is somewhat precarious, as The Wrath of Khan contains a reference to Botany Bay's launch in 96, but Chernobyl hadn't happened yet. Then Chernobyl happened, which influenced the plot of The Undiscovered Country, released in 1991, the year the Soviet Union collapsed, even though there's a reference to the USSR supposedly still existing in the 24th century in the TNG episode The Naked Now, which aired in 1987. Oh man. This is your career. I hope this gets more than 20,000 views. I hope it gets more than 30,000 views. We're working too hard again, aren't we? I have the bachelor's degree. Future's End and Voyager is about the personal computer revolution of the 1990s, an event which the Voyager crew are familiar with. But did that take place in the TOS timeline as well, with the eugenics wars and all that? You see what I mean? This, this shit is getting confusing. And again, it's difficult to determine whether Enterprise really takes place in the same timeline as the Next Generation era shows, since Daniels says things like, History doesn't mention anything about a conflict between humans and Zindi. How could that be? The events that are taking place are the result of temporal incursions. They are not supposed to be happening. So it's an understatement to say that the temporal cold war introduces some complications. That said, I think it's kind of interesting to ponder not just you know, how the dates of the eugenics wars might have been pushed back, but also what other events could be unique to this separate TOS timeline. Believe it or not, we actually have something of a rough outline as to what might truly distinguish the TOS version of history from later versions of Trek, or at the very least from our history. In 1979, a reference book called Spaceflight Chronology was published by Pocket Books, written by Stan and Fred Goldstein and illustrated by Rick Sternback. At the time of printing, it was considered canonical, a designation that no longer applies to any supplementary reference materials. But suffice it to say, spaceflight chronology presents a timeline of Earth's technological development, at least what the authors speculated could happen beyond 1980. Events from 1957 to 1979 follow the historical record with the exception of the episode Assignment Earth set in 1968, as the Outer Space Treaty made the launch of fractional orbital bombardment systems illegal. According to the chronology, NASA's space shuttle goes on to be wildly successful, helping humanity establish a permanent foothold in space, including solar power satellites beaming energy to Earth, and is phased out in favor of a more advanced craft by 1992. Starting in 1995, the DY-100 becomes the first mass-produced spacecraft, making regular runs to the moon and being adapted for the first crewed mission to Mars. Crucially, the eugenics wars don't seem to have discouraged spaceflight, rather promoted it. Similarly to the off-world colonization program following a possible 90s world World War III in the Blade Runner universe. A permanent moon base is established in 1998, possibly a joint venture between the US and Russia, with a second base on the far side beginning operations by 2004 and being the site of the first off-Earth human birth. The first human landing on Mars might occur in the 2003 to 2005 launch period as the Red Planet makes its closest approach to Earth, which happens in 15-year cycles, and multiple Star Trek novels indicate the first human to set foot on Mars is a female astronaut. The first L5 city, presumably a space habitat at the Earth's L5 Lagrange point, is completed in 2007, 
with another six completed by 2019. 2008 sees the development of a new Earth-Moon liner, as well as the Aventure class, which makes manned voyages to the outer solar system over the subsequent two decades. The 2010s allegedly see several Mars bases built, possibly using materials from the 2005 launch period or starting in 2018 with the Red Planet's next closest approach. This decade also sees the first homesteading in the asteroid belt. Sean Jeffrey Christopher's ship, the UNSS Lewis and Clark, visits Saturn in 2020, a reference to the episode Tomorrow is Yesterday. The 2020s bring even further development of the asteroid belt, which is supported by ships like the DY-500, as well as early colonization of Venus. Spaceflight Chronology says terraforming, although orbital cities in Venus's upper cloud layers are a more realistic start. By 2042, Spaceflight Chronology imagines a base on Pluto and manned sublight missions to Alpha Centauri and Barnard Star, as well as an interplanetary communications network in 2044 that guarantees reliable communication throughout the solar system. After this point, spaceflight chronology tends to break even further away from canon, presenting Earth as a stronger and more dynamic entity in the mid-21st century than the war-ravaged planet on the brink of collapse as depicted in Enterprise and the Next Generation era. First contact is not with the Vulcans, but a civilization called the Centaurans, humans potentially transplanted by the preservers from Earth to Alpha Centauri in the ancient past. And Zephram Cochran is not Montanan, but Centauran, a hyper-literal interpretation of his origins as established in the TOS episode Metamorphosis. Zephram Cochran of Alpha Centauri, the discoverer of the space warp? That's right, Captain. But let's say for the sake of this video that the TOS timeline that we're imagining is merely inspired by spaceflight chronology. So Zephram Cochran's still human, and the UNSS Icarus that arrives at Alpha Centauri in 2048 finds evidence of microbial, fungal, and basic animal and plant life, but no intelligent life since Alpha Centauri is merely described in canon as a human colony. So, no Na'vi either. Well, yeah, yeah, no Na'vi. Regardless, spaceflight chronology states humans break the light barrier in 2055, eight years earlier than in canon, with the WD-1 test vehicle, based on theories by Zephram Cochran. The pilot, a chimpanzee. And the WD-1 test vehicle, obviously an early prototype of the more robust WD-40. In 2059, the UNSS Bonaventure becomes Earth's first fully functioning warp ship and sets course for the Tau Ceti system. Later in this period, Mars declares independence, and Earth makes first contact with the Vulcans, Tellarites, Andorians, Rigelians, and others. It's also revealed that humans are one of the most technologically advanced civilizations in local space, as opposed to our depiction in Enterprise as being something of an interstellar backwater under the tutelage of the paternalistic Vulcans. Spaceflight chronology's timeline after first contact somewhat resembles the build-up to Enterprise in the original series, including the founding of the Federation and the Earth-Romulan War, but the dates are all off. For one thing, the Federation is founded in 2087, a date used by other early TOS novels, rather than 2161, and the launch of the Enterprise is indicated to be 2200, even though later media indicates TOS to be set in the mid-23rd century. But as for everything before First Contact, I think we can take that with a little more than just a tiny grain of salt. In any event, going back to Earth's technology being more advanced, it's this aspect of the spaceflight chronology timeline, as well as the general concept of Earth's achievements happening earlier in the TOS version of history compared to the next generation in Enterprise that's further validated by other lines of dialogue in Strange New Worlds.
tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow brings up one other aspect of all of this that I find endlessly fascinating. Sarah is not just there to kill Khan, but she's part of a group of Romulan temporal agents that have been sent to various time periods in Earth's past to slow down human progress. She lists a bunch of historical events that are secretly Romulan attacks, including Chernobyl, Tunguska, JFK, random gas leak explosions. Like presumably the Bhopal disaster, with over 1600 deaths linked to it. This got me thinking, there must be some other original version of Earth's history that even the TOS timeline is a bastardization of. Nested simulations, nested timelines. I'm not exactly sure what the 1908 Tunguska event, which saw 80 million trees flattened in Siberia, has to do with all of this. Unless they are, of course, talking about the secret base that got wiped out. FBI, open up! But JFK's assassination has, in popular culture, been frequently associated with slowing down technological progress. The idea being that he might not have escalated the Vietnam War as much as Lyndon B. Johnson did, thus freeing up more government funds for scientific research. And with less war debt, the US economy would be in better shape in the 1970s. The Chernobyl explosion is, of course, widely credited with accelerating or even causing the demise of the Soviet Union due to the immense cost of the cleanup. Indeed, the USSR's final collapse actually dealt a blow to US science as Congress was less willing to fund risky ventures like the superconducting supercollider. Similarly, the destruction of the fictitious Lake Ontario Bridge in the episode is cited as yet another example of deteriorating international relations, and thus yet another example of the Romulans slowing down human progress. Extrapolating this out even further in the original timeline, it's possible that the exact series of events that led to the Watergate scandal simply didn't occur. Watergate, along with Vietnam, has been credited with further eroding Americans' trust in government. If the eugenics wars still happened in this original timeline, then the vastly different geopolitical landscape in the wake of this conflict might mean 9-11 doesn't happen either. The war on terror in our timeline dominated the political zeitgeist of the 2000s and dampened cultural conversations surrounding issues like free trade, globalization, immigration, and poverty reduction. And of course, all of this led to where we are today, influencing the political careers and presidencies of people like Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden. Admittedly, this is highly speculative and a pretty America-centric view, although it is worth noting that in the case of Chernobyl, to the extent that it did contribute to the collapse of the Soviet Union, avoiding the post-collapse recession of the 1990s would have saved the post-Soviet states a lot of pain and suffering. And before somebody thinks that I'm saying the Soviet Union did nothing wrong, no idiots. And of course, it's not like we actually see this timeline in any Star Trek productions since even the original series premiered years after JFK's death. But it's interesting to think about. So, to recap once more, there's at least three versions of the Star Trek timeline that Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow implies the existence of. An unaltered timeline where humans presumably reached out to the stars earlier. The TOS timeline where JFK was assassinated, but the eugenics wars still happen in the 1990s, and a timeline where the eugenics wars happen in the 21st century. Indeed, there might actually be four timelines. The unaltered timeline, the TOS timeline, the TNG DS9 and Voyager timeline, and the Enterprise Discovery Strange New Worlds Lower Decks Picard and Prodigy timeline. Again, I didn't write I didn't make them write this in, in the episodes. I didn't make them, I did not make them do this. They're making me do this. And there might be even more timelines beyond that that incorporate some mix of events like Tunguska, Bhopal, Chernobyl, and so on. And as for things like the Zindi conflict, Daniel's future of origin, and how those relate to the Next Generation era shows that came before Enterprise, 
that's all kind of still up in the air. Like I said, this is not really the direction I would have personally gone with Trek's lore, since I've never really had any trouble reconciling the idea that Star Trek is an alternate timeline. But again, if Star Trek is still supposed to represent an optimistic possible future for humanity, then at some point or another, the writers were going to make a decision like this. And maybe Trek is better for it actually. After all, it's always been meant to function as a commentary on present-day social issues, so one could say that making Star Trek's early 21st century more relatable actually enhances the narrative. If the Trek timeline has been substantially altered by the Romulans, and that's why the Prime Universe now more closely resembles our reality, then that begs the question, is this an acceptable thing for sci-fi to do? coming up with secret histories to explain our real one. I mean, you know, for instance, in the case of Chernobyl, it was probably human error that led to that accident. It wasn't aliens. In Star Trek, it was aliens. So should science fiction stray away from these kinds of explanations? Let me know your thoughts on that down below. Hopefully this discussion hasn't been too rambly. I, I probably failed miserably on that front. Also, perhaps there's something I've omitted or overlooked. Let me know your thoughts on Strange New Worlds, Prime Timeline alterations overall as well down below. With that, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well so you won't miss future uploads, and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you want to support my work even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash orange river, link in the description, or become a YouTube member by clicking the join button on my channel page. By becoming a patron or member, you get access to awesome perks like behind the scenes photos and videos, patron and member only polls, name in the credits, merch discounts, and more. Or you can drop a one-time super thanks or PayPal donation. All are appreciated. Links to my PayPal as well as my social media and merch store are in the description. That's all I have for this week. Jolan True, live long and prosper.